up? Glad you are here tonight. Um, glad no one died grabbing some cups. Man, how, how amazing. Um, man, just as worship. Just when we just take a moment and, and point our lives towards the Lord and allow Him to uh, just kind of reveal His love to us, um, His grace, His forgiveness to us in those moments where we're, where we're singing about His love. I don't know about you, when I, when I think about and start singing that, I, I just start thinking about all the, all the things I've done that I've messed up on, all, all the, the ways that I am unworthy, and yet his love covers all of that. How, how great is that? <clears throat> um, as you know, we are talking about a relationship, a series called Relationship Goals. It's, it's hashtag because the graphic people put a hashtag there. And second... Because that's the way you read it on Instagram, Brandon. So old. Okay, so I'm joking, Brandon. I'm joking. He's like only like a year older than me. Um, <clears throat> so we're talking. Uh, we started off last week, and, and tonight, um, <clears throat> in the next few weeks, we're just going to begin to kind of look at the different stages of relationship. And here's why. And here's why I think it's important, um, really, that you tune in tonight. Because the things, and, and some of you are in here right now, <clears throat> and what your goal is in your relationships is like, you're like, man, I don't really need one. I don't want one. I, I'm, I'm good being me right now. Like, I, I'm just ready to, to roll with school or whatever. And like, I'm not really looking for a relationship. And you truthfully aren't. But what you need to know is, is that the, the way that you prepare now will affect the relationships when you decide you want one. And others in here, you are saying the same thing. No, I'm not looking for a relationship, but truthfully, that's just a cover-up, and you absolutely are looking for a relationship, and that was me as a high schooler. was like, no, I'm not looking for no relationship, unless you're interested. Are you interested, right? Like, are you want to be in a relationship? I'll be in a relationship. Um, <laughs> and then others of you are either in relationships or you're absolutely looking for relationships, whether you're saying it or not. And how you handle those things now will be a huge determiner about how the future goes. And so that's what I'm going to kind of share with you tonight. And so in return, my, um, what, what I'm asking of you in return is one that you would just be respectful and that you would listen. And more so, not that you would be respectful so that I would feel respected or wouldn't have my feelings hurt because it, it doesn't really affect me that way. But more so that, that you would be in a place where you are listening to what God has in store for you. That you wouldn't allow the people around you to distract you. That you wouldn't allow your cell phone to be a distraction for you. That you would put that on vibrate. You'd put that on silent that you would just allow this time to be a time where the Lord um, is able to get a, a clear voice into your heart and into your life tonight. And so that's all I'm asking from you. I'm gonna share a little bit in, in, in return that you just listen. Cool, I'm gonna pray for us real quick. God, I thank you for this time together. <clears throat> I thank you for these students. Lord, I thank you uh, for your word and the way that um, it guides us and it directs our lives. Lord, I ask that we would choose to listen to that, that you would help us to choose that, or that you would help us to choose what is best, which is uh, your direction in our life and your will in our, in our life. And Lord, I ask that you would speak clearly through me, that I wouldn't go off on my own ideas or my own thoughts, but God, that it would be simply rooted in, in your truth. And Lord, that these students would have ears to hear and understand, and, and God, that it would begin to change our lives so that we are more like you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so what you need to know about me, is I'm married and have been married for four years. And we got married in uh, September 21st. There it is. September 21st uh, is our anniversary. <coughs> and it has been awesome. We have two kids. Uh, and you may know this already, a two and a half year old. Um, if you were there this morning, then you heard me tell the throw up story um, about how my son learned to throw up for the first time on Friday, which that was exciting. Turns out, uh, when it's your first time, you don't know to bend over, and so you just bleh, all over yourself, right? And that's really great. Uh, the other, other child is much uh, less throw-uppy, and she is <coughs> six months old. Awesome. Awesome kids. Awesome family. What you need to know, and what you need to just be 100% clear on, is that my marriage and my relationship with my wife um, 
is nowhere near perfect. Um, in fact, it, it, we have a lot of our own issues we're always working through. And the reason why is because two imperfect people decided to get into a relationship, me and my wife. And so we brought two imperfect things together. And so, of course, it's never two imperfects aren't going to make something perfect. <clears throat> and so we have a, a lot of, of um, times we have to really talk through and work through things like any relationship. But can I tell you that the number one advantage in our relationship, that the, probably the biggest blessing in our relationship <clears throat> is how my wife handled her singleness. How my wife handled her singleness has been the number one blessing in our relationship. The biggest advantage. That when she was in middle school, when she was in high school, when she was even into college, she did not spend a whole lot of time chasing the opinions of guys or chasing guys at all. <clears throat> she spent a lot of time <clears throat> chasing God's will for her life. She spent a lot of time in, her, in the Bible getting to know her father. That she didn't spend a lot of time with other dudes. She chose one, and that was the Lord. And she has brought the biggest, because of those choices she made in middle school and in high school and in college, the biggest blessing to our relationship. And can I tell you the number one hindrance to our relationship? the absolute biggest obstacle we always are having to get over <clears throat> is the way that I handled my singleness when I was in middle school and in high school and in college. See, instead of running after the Father and His will for my life, I was running after whatever lady wanted to come by I was running after whatever came up on my computer. I was running after all the desires of this world. That I brought to the table when we decided to say I do. A whole bag full of regrets, full of scars, full of history, full of memories. She brought to the table, I want you to just imagine this, just a clean, white, pure slate. That I brought a bunch of junk. She brought something pure and clean. And the way she treated her singleness has been the biggest blessing. The biggest obstacle has been what I brought to the table because I didn't handle my singleness well. That there is a time and a place for relationships that God has planned for you. That God had planned for me. But I decided not to listen to that. I sat in chairs like you sat in. I heard people like me speak and I decided to be distracted. I decided to not take it seriously. So it, it, it continues to affect my life because of the things I brought to the table. Now, I want to preface this just real quick, a little side note, is that our God is the great redeemer and that he's the great forgiver, that he's the one that can restore the nastiest, dirtiest, worst of, of sinners and adopt them into his family and call them sons and call them daughters. That he, he takes the hearts of stone and gives hearts of flesh that he gives us the strength to get over regrets and over sin. That though I still deal with obstacles, they are not anything that are weighing me down daily and holding me back because I know Jesus died for that. That is not mine to claim, but I've been forgiven. And so side note, if you're in here and, and, and you're dealing with things or, or you end up dealing with things, know that Jesus, and through repentance, says, man, I will restore you. That's awesome. It's not a hopeless situation. 
But the way I handled my singleness has not made that very easy. And what blows my mind is that so many young people today, so many teenagers today are just so eager to get into relationships. That we're so eager to jump into them as if being single is bad or being single is a punishment or being single makes you less of a person. And I'm not, man, you better know this, I am not talking about friends with benefits single. Now you're like, I'm single, yeah, we messing, but I'm, no, 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 you ain't single. I'm talking truthfully before God, saying, man, I want to honor God with everything he's given me. Single. Not filling, not trying to fill a void with someone else's love or desires. So many of us want to jump into that as if it's some kind of punishment. And the biggest issue with relationships today and people in relationships is not necessarily a relationship issue as more it is a singleness issue. That people didn't learn to be single and learn to appreciate their singleness before they jumped into a relationship. And so they tried to make the relationship fill the void that they thought was caused by the singleness The problem is it isn't the remedy for fulfilling the singleness void. So things don't go well. See, many of us, when we jump into relationships, it's because we don't want to be alone. But there is a big difference in being alone and being single. See, alone is all in one, that you are alone, you are by yourself. It means unloved or or unwelcomed, that you are alone. I don't think God ever wants us to be alone. That usually in our singleness, that's the void that is there. Man, I want to know that I'm, I'm loved and I'm cared for and I'm valued and I find that in someone else. I want people to look up to me. I want, really as a guy, I don't know if y'all feel this, what I felt was like, I need a girl that I can brag to my buddies about. She could be the worst girl, like, just don't talk, but I just want them to see you. Like, look at her, right? Like, she likes me. Like, that's what I was about. She likes me. She said it, right? It was over aim. That's what we used. But she likes me. I didn't care about who she was. I didn't care about how her heart was with the Lord. No, it was like, man, she likes me. She's hot. And that's what I'm talking about because it's a pride issue. I needed something to fill the void. It was alone. There's a difference in alone and single. And so often we get those mixed up. It is only Jesus, what you need to understand, that can fill that alone void. It is only when we run to Jesus and pursue Jesus and talk to Jesus and and worship Jesus and begin to make Jesus a part of our life and care about the things that Jesus cares about that we begin to fill the alone void. The difference in alone and single is single in, in its definition means unique, set apart, no one else like it. That is something to brag about, to be single. That God has made each of you singular. Lee. He didn't duplicate you all over the earth, but he made you unique with your DNA and your fingerprints and your characteristics and your humor and your creativity and your looks. He made you single. The problem is, is we don't get that straight before we get into relationships. That is something we gotta know. That is something we've gotta be confident in, confident in is our singleness. I love what Romans says in, in Romans 12. <clears throat> this is where we're gonna kind of stick tonight. It's Paul writing. 
Paul writing, and, and he, he's been, obviously, it's chapter 12, he's written 11 chapters before this, and so he starts in chapter 12 with a big therefore. He says, I appeal to you, therefore. That therefore, he says, I appeal to you, therefore. And in that therefore, he's summing up chapters three through chapter 11, where he's talking about the grace of God. He says, man, you were sinners, yet Christ died for you. And since Christ died for you and your faith is in him, you've received the Holy Spirit. That's chapter eight. And he says, you are now no longer victims of sin. You are no longer held by the law, but you have been set free. At the end of chapter eight, he says, man, and then what can separate us from the love of God? That there is nothing that can separate us from God's love, that God is a gracious God despite our sin. And so then he starts and he says, so I appeal to you, therefore, because of all of that, Brothers, by the mercy of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices. This word bodies. It doesn't mean like your physical body. Like I always just used to think, like, that's kind of weird. Like, you know, you're just like, okay, God, like, here I am. Like, what are we going to do, right? No, he's not talking about your bodies as a living sacrifice. He's saying like your whole self, every part of you, every part of you, I was like some of you in here that I went to church with my one foot and I went to the party on the weekend with my other foot. That was one foot in the door and said, God, you can have this much of my body as a living sacrifice. I'll go on some mission trips. I'll go on some camps. I'll even worship you. Sometimes, God, you're going to break me down to tears, but you better believe I ain't moving this foot out of the party scene. You better believe that this foot is staying right there. It wasn't until college that I decided, okay, I need to start standing more like this. He says, man, because of God's grace and understanding of God's grace and recognition that he sacrificed it all for you. He says, allowing that to change us, man, let us present our whole self as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. What you need to know is you're not holy. It's only because of Jesus that we can be seen as holy. Holy and acceptable God, which is your spiritual worship. Man. He says, let your whole self, your whole life be an act of worship. Meaning it proclaims the grace of God. That's a big thing. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but but be transformed by the renewing and the renewal of your mind. If you looked up conformed and transformed in the dictionary, you would see almost the same definition or same root word. If you put synonyms in, in word and you like wrote up, you put synonyms, transformed and conformed, they both, the synonym is changed, changed. He says, do not be changed to this world, but be changed by the renewal of your mind. There's a problem here. There's a difference in that change. If you are ever going to conform to something, it means that you are going to lose something. You are going to conform to rules. You are going to conform to norms. You are going to conform to expectations. You are going to conform to lies, maybe. You are going to change, maybe losing your humor, losing your creativity, losing your freedom, losing uh, your, your purity, losing whatever it is, right? You are going to lose something conformed to the world. You're going to change from your original intention. So he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That change, transform, you need to hear this. It's a change that he adds something to. He says, man, I made you perfect. Sin has screwed a lot of things up, but through the Holy Spirit's work in you, I'm going to transform you into something greater. I'm going to transform you by the renewal of your mind. As great as you think you can think now, that was a lot of things. As great as you are now in thinking, as smart as you think you are, as wise as you think you are. He says, man, I want to transform your mind. That I want to add wisdom. That I want to add understanding of your identity that I want to add so that you are better than you are now. 
I want to change you for the better. He says, don't be conformed where you lose, but be transformed where you gain. By the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He says, therefore, because of God's grace, commit your bodies to the work of the Lord as your act of worship, putting him before everything else, not being conformed, changed for the negative, but being transformed, changed for the positive, so that you may gain wisdom and understanding of God and understand his will for your life, which is always good and always perfect and always acceptable. The problem is people come and they talk to me and they dealing with things and they're saying, man, I don't know why this is happening to me. I don't know what's going on in my life. And the problem starts right here. That their whole body and what they are worshiping is not the Lord who has a good and perfect will for their life. It's something else. And so when God's trying to get a hold of their life or consequences are coming for their actions, they don't understand it because they don't know what the will of God is. They have not been transformed in their mind to understand that his will for their life is good and is perfect and is acceptable. And it usually starts right here, that they're worshiping sports, they're worshiping relationships, they're worshiping with their whole body academics, they're worshiping pride, they're worshiping identity, they're worshiping reputation, they're worshiping all these things. They've committed their whole bodies to something else. So they are not having their minds renewed, but instead they're being conformed. And they don't understand God's will. He's saying, hey, brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm challenging you to repent from those things. That the thing you commit your whole body to is not another individual, is not uh, another hobby, is not another goal in life, but the thing that you commit your whole body to is knowing God. That in your singleness, in your uniqueness, in your time, right now, before you stand before someone and say, I do. That your spiritual act of worship would be with your whole body. Every part of you would be dedicated to worshiping God. He says, and the result is that he begins to give you wisdom and understanding. You begin to see the character of God. You begin to see how loving he is and you begin to see his plans for you and you begin to understand why things happen and you begin to understand through the trials that he hasn't abandoned you but he is simply refining you sometimes. That you begin to understand that even when it doesn't make sense even in that aspect that he is still walking with you and that ultimately, ultimately his plan is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul saying, man, Who are you worshiping? How are you handling your singleness? There's no way where you're being conformed or being transformed. He goes on in in, uh, verse four or verse three. He says, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith, that God has assigned. He says, for as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many are of one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. He says, so though we are one body, though there are a lot of people in here, God doesn't see you as just one body, one clump, one group. You are individuals in one group. That individually, he says, man, I am giving you an identity in me. Individually, you are singular. 
having a uniqueness that no one else is like you in here. No one else uh, knows God the way you know God. No one else has your sense of humor. No one else has your love and compassion for others. No one else has your capacity to forgive the people around you. No one else is like you. He says, man, that is what makes us the body of Christ. He says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. See, when we begin to see that God has made us in totality complete and perfect, that when we begin to worship him and to see his plan and to see his timing, then getting into a relationship doesn't become this epic ordeal where we've got to have it and we need to have it. Why? Because we are in totality complete with knowing our Father. We know him. And the biggest blessing that you'll bring to your future relationships, I want you to hear this. The biggest blessing that you'll bring to your relationships is your understanding of you and your singleness. When you understand that you are unique, and that you are complete through Christ. If that is the biggest blessing that you bring to a relationship, when you bring the spiritual gifts that God has given you to a relationship, it becomes your biggest advantage. When we decide not to rush things, not to listen to the lust of the world, not to listen to uh, our hormones, not to listen to others. When we begin to say, God, I'm gonna wait on your timing, and in me waiting, I'm going to worship you then our future relationships will be blessed. Then we are setting our relationships up for success.